refining and revising the final draft. Their brief, to make the King James Bible not only read well in English, but sound well, a quality for which it's revered to this day. Let's compare a passage in Henry VIII's Great Bible with one in the King James Version. The Great Bible in chapter 12 of Ecclesiastes, the preacher says, or ever the silver lace be taken away, or the gold band be broke, or the pot be broke at the well, and the wheel upon the cistern, then shall the dust be turned again unto earth from whence it came, and the spirit shall return unto God which gave it. All is but vanity, saith the preacher, all is but plain vanity. And the King James makes that into, or ever the silver cord be loosed, or the golden bowl be broken, or the pitcher be broken at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, all is vanity. And I think you can see from that comparison that not only is the King James Version clearer, but a good deal more poetic. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Contemporary with the King James Bible, the Book of Common Prayer expresses the rites of passage in the English church. From the cradle to the grave. Renounce the devil and all his works. Give us this day our daily bread. With this ring I thee wed. Earth to earth, dust to dust, ashes to ashes. There's an air of innocence to the ease with which Shakespeare and his contemporaries, poets, playwrights, even translating committees, explored the language to the limits. At the end of the 16th century, this was the language, rich in vocabulary, bursting with innovation, that was first brought to the New World by adventurers like Francis Drake and Walter Raleigh. So Walter Raleigh, who had this farm in Devon, rolled his Devonshire R's to his dying day. His speech was actually parodied by Shakespeare, but he was a typical Elizabethan, renowned as a poet, statesman, and explorer, the sort of man people like to gossip about. And he was the first to take English to the uncharted shores of the New World. In 1584, Raleigh, who'd always dreamed of setting up English cities overseas, sent two ships across the Atlantic. This was the first of three brave attempts to establish an English-speaking colony in the place he named Virginia in honor of his queen. The first of his ships made its landfall on the coast of North Carolina. In the words of the captain, very sandy and low towards the waterside. A 
A settlement was established at a place they called Roanoke, after a local Indian expression. The second expedition to Roanoke was led by John White, a gifted amateur painter who kept a remarkable pictorial record of his experiences. At first, relations with the American tribes were good. In the next 100 years, English settlers picked up many Indian words to describe the unfamiliar scenes around them. Squaw and papoose, skunk, toboggan, moccasin, and chipmunk. American English eventually borrowed hundreds of Indian words, from wigwam to tomahawk. These first colonists also borrowed Indian turns of phrase, like bury the hatchet and go on the warpath. But the Roanoke adventure turned sour. Settlers and natives fought about scarce supplies. John White set off back to England for food and relief. On his return, he blew a trumpet to announce his arrival. His men sang English songs, but there was no answer. The Roanoke colony was deserted. To this day, the fate of Raleigh's settlement remains a mystery, but its place in history has been overshadowed. Almost a generation later, in 1607, three more English ships, like these, anchored in six fathoms of water off a wooded island. The sailors called it Jamestown, after their new king. From over the water, they could hear the cries of the native Indians, the first sounds from a vast and unexplored continent. After searching in vain down the coast for the Roanoke colony, these Jamestown settlers held on by the skin of their teeth and became the first English-speaking Americans. Many of the Virginians who lived here in Jamestown and who settled in colonies like Maryland and the Carolinas would have had strong West Country tones, like Walter Raleigh. Their distinctive burr became a fundamental characteristic of much American English. Here and there, in isolated communities on the East Coast, you can still catch the sound of those lost voices. We're in the middle of Chesapeake Bay, a vast estuary lying to the south and east of Washington, D.C. It's famous for its oysters and crabs. This is little Tangier Island. Here you can still hear a kind of language fossil, a variety of English that's probably changed very little since the first sailors from Cornwall landed here in the 1680s. This is my song, raising my savior all the day long. What a wretched man I am. You know, in a city this day and time, you see the devil so strong, and the people is just going right along with him. It's only when you accept Christ as your Savior that you have to buckle this tolerance. Ben, 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 Ben,